Turkey. Uh, he's really the Lord our Savior, as I said before. And uh, don't forget these students because your family is great and uh, God be great. So, Amen. Amen. Don't forget these students. If you have your Bibles with you tonight, I'd like to cover the scriptures in Acts. And uh, I, I won't be jumping around today. It'll just be in the book of Acts. It's going to be in chapter 1, verses 12 through 26. Verses 12 through 26. I'm going to speak to you tonight about choosing your pastor. I, I want you to maybe take some notes and try to understand some of the things I might be bringing to you. Uh, this is not an indictment on you, nor does it mean that you do not know how to choose your pastor. But I would like to give you an idea of some things that could help you when it comes to making decisions and choosing your pastor and voting doesn't matter whether it's me or anyone else standing behind this pulpit that would be determined and that you have a call that you would choose. I would like to know in my heart that in your heart you have a solid foundation of which to stand on in choosing your pastor. Uh, one of the things that I think is important is that you leave all of the emotions out of it. Leave all of the preconceived ideas that you might have out of it. Because most of the time, that's what happens. Uh, but before I get into my sermon, I want to get into the scripture. And let's go with the verse 12, and we will continue all the way to the rest of the chapter. It says, Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John. Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, and James the son of Alphaeus, and, son, and Simon uh, Zealot, and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. So uh, no doubt that prayer has a lot to do with it. But in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples that's, and said, The number of names together were about 120 men and brethren. This scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was God to them that took Jesus, for he was numbered with us and had obtained part this ministry. Now I want you to understand that what they were saying was part of this ministry. And I want you to understand that the person that you would be voting for would be a part of this ministry, this particular ministry that God has ordained here in this town. Now this man purchased the field of them. Uh, I'm sorry, purchased the field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the mist and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers of Jerusalem, insomuch as the field is called in their proper tongue, al Sadama, that is to say, the field of blood. What is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. Wherefore are these men which have companied with us all the time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they pointed to Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of, of all men, Show whether these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and the prophetship from which Judas, by transgression, fell, that he might go into his go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Now I don't want to take this scripture totally out of context, but I think there is a great example of what we need to understand on when it comes to choosing someone after someone has, has vacated a position 
or after someone has, has, has not in the position anymore. And it's hard because we get to the point where we get kind of, I want to say, complacent. You get a person or that person, uh, uh, you get used to them. You get used to seeing that person. You get used to uh, serving with that person. You get used to listening to that person. And, and there's a rapport and, uh, and there's a bond that's established. And a lot of times what happens is it's very hard to want to replace the person that's no longer with you. But uh, the scriptures must needs be fulfilled. You're at that time in this church and at that place where choice has to be made. And eventually, the choice will have to be made in order for the ministry to grow. And you'll notice that when they went up into the upper room, there were 120 devout men. And one of the things that they realized, and one of the things that was pointed out to them, was that the position of Judas had to be filled. He had to be numbered with him. And as we look into the scripture, we can get a great example of what it takes in our hearts in order to choose the man of God. I want you to remember that when you choose the man of God, you're choosing the man of God, you're choosing the person that God has impressed upon your heart. Now, a lot of times people uh, see uh, or, or hear what they want to hear. We kind of have a preconceived idea of what we want. Uh, if you remember the story uh, when uh, Israel wanted a king, and God didn't want Israel to have a king because he was their king. And they said, no, we want a king. And God kept sending Samuel back to, to the children and kept saying, Tell the people that if they get this king, this is what's going to happen. And the people still said, ah, we want a king. And so God knew who he had chosen. But even though God had someone in sight, Samuel already had a preconceived idea of who the king should be. And after Saul had been chosen and before David became the king, Samuel kept bringing and going to different uh, men, uh, supposing that that's who God had chose. And God said, no, I know who I want. And finally, he went to the tribe of Benjamin. And there was David. And that's who God chose to be the king. And now, so we look upon you, what's facing you in the future, is you're going to have to have a future pastor. And a lot of times when a new pastor comes in, there's a lot of hurt feelings and there's a lot of emotional uh, things that happen to people that would cause them to kind of back away a little bit. And that's not the time that you back away is when you choose a new leader, but it's the time that you get behind the man of God and you support him. And the reason why you have to support him is because all of what's in your past, has you have to let go of. These men had to die. They didn't hate Judas. Judas betrayed our Lord Jesus Christ. Judas Iscariot betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ. And because he betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ, he hung himself. He hung himself from his feet and his head was down. And so they understood what needed to be done. And so the first point that I'd like to point out to is that everybody needs to understand the urgency of the need of a leader, the need of a pastor. I can't tell you how many times that I've been in churches where they kind of have hesitated. And I'm not saying that you have hesitated. I'm saying that, that other churches that I've been in have not only hesitated, but uh, uh, they start to living without their leader start worshiping and they start teaching and they, they all of a sudden they start to begin to think that they don't need a pastor. That they can do it without a pastor. And that's as unscriptural as you can get because even though sometimes you might feel like that the idea of having a pastor is because God has placed the pastor in leadership position 
in the church. And without that, you are missing a vital link in the church. And you need that. Because God has strategically uh, placed him there in order for you to be able to run the ministry that God has planned for you to do. But without the pastor, you're, you're just going to be exactly what you are. You're going to meet. You're going to pray. You're going to provide some ministry. But you will never go as far as you could go until you made the decision to choose a pastor. Now, if you look at the scriptures here, Peter stood up. And when he said, uh, men and brethren, in verse 16, he said, the scripture must needs have been fulfilled which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was God to them that took him. For he was numbered with us and had obtained a part of this ministry. The urgent need, they understood what was happening. And you go on and you keep reading and you get all the way and you start to see that they're realizing all the way up and to verse 20 where it says, for it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate and let no man dwell therein and his bishopric let another take. take place within the congregation. And if that healing doesn't take place, then there's always going to be some ill feeling, and there's always going to be somebody who just can't let go and who can't move forward. And such as is life, isn't it? That when things happen to us, we can't do anything about it. And so, there's this Just like these men were. Right before this happened, Jesus ascended into heaven. And then they turned around and they walked to try to save Jonah to get to the upper room. And when he came up there with them, Peter stood up and said, Men and brethren, we have come to the uh, part where now we have to find someone to replace Judas. And every church that is without a pastor to the point where they have to find a new pastor. I don't like to use the word replace, and in my closing, I'll tell you exactly why, but they got to that point. And so everyone who's ever involved in this ministry, in this ministry, has gotten to come to the point and realize that So you must realize the urgent need for your pastor. Point number two, you must seek a qualified individual. You must seek a qualified individual. Let's flip over here in Acts where it says, Wherefore these men, in verse 21, have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the same day that Jesus was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. That was the qualification to be the apostle. Now, he was numbered with the 11 apostles. The Bible didn't necessarily say that he was just one, but they had to choose a person who would be numbered with them and take part of this particular ministry. And you'll notice that when Paul was on his way to Damascus, he had a personal meeting with Jesus Christ which is what made him that apostle. And that's why the office of apostleship does not exist today is because no one qualifies to be an apostle. Because
Because in order to qualify to be an apostle, you would have had to do exactly what it says there in the book of Acts. You would have had to personally accompany with them. You would have had to seen Jesus in his ministry. And you would have also had to watch him as he ascended into heaven. All the way, you would have had to be a part of that. that. That is the qualification that they were looking for. There were 120 men in that room. Today we go to Timothy and Titus, and we talk about the qualifications of pastors. And then you see that churches sometimes will pick a pastor that may not uh, have all the qualifications and, and will go ahead because some churches get a little tired. They need a pastor right away. And so what happens is we just stick anybody in there. And that's not what you're supposed to do. Make sure that he is on the level and the plane that God wants him to be on in order to carry out the work of the ministry in this church. But most people sometimes, and, and I've been to churches where they said, well, we just picked them anyway. You wouldn't believe some of the atrocities that some pastors have committed behind the pulpit, and all because the congregation pick somebody behind the pulpit so they could say they have a preacher. That's not the right way to do it. It, it would be nice, you know, sometimes uh, you go to a church and stuff and you can think of a lot of things that you can say and say and get them in and you know, they can't stop coming to your pulpit and sometimes you really want to say, yes, I, I want to be there. But what's more important is that the man of God is right standing right where I'm at. That's what's important. And it could be me and it could not be me. But here I am. I'm preaching in view of the call. And I remember being asked, why Southwest Springs and why Arkansas? I said, because you got back in touch with me. You called me. You asked. And I felt that in your body, the Lord may have been leading you in this direction. And so I answered obedient to God to answer him out here and to be able to preach in the house of God. And these men, when they began to choose whom that qualified, there were two. Just two. It's amazing that when a church becomes vacant, you put it out on the internet and you get a thousand names. And then the poor, poor the poor pulpit committee has to sit there and go through every resume because they're trying to find the best person. They're seeking God's wisdom on the best person. And here they are. And everybody that sends in the resume thinks, I'm the best person. And may I say to you, I, I've never sent my resume out like that. I, I don't send out resumes all the time. And when I send them out, I just send them out. I don't even think about it after I send them out. I just continue to do what I'm doing. But but there are, there are guys who are polished. There are guys who look good. There are guys who sound good. There are guys who just look the part. But looking the part is not the answer. And the answer is always in what God sees in the individual that he wants to bring to you. And you've got to stay the course. And so the second thing, of course, is making sure that the person that he's preaching is qualified to stand behind that preaching and to lead you to say you need to be on there. Because he's got the final word. Paul even says, Trust God in this, but follow God because he's got to make tough decisions. The church I'm in right now, I had to make some tough decisions, and I did it, and believe me. Sometimes when you first take over a church, there is an attack that comes to that new pastor. There is problems that come to that new pastor. And when I would sit behind my desk and I'd have people sitting in front of me, and they were 
tried to give me ultimatum, I would listen to him. And I would strive because I love him. But the one thing that I never allowed to happen to me, or to happen to me, was to be those decisions and I stand firm behind those decisions I make. And you're going to count, encounter some loss as a pastor and you're going to encounter some gain as a pastor. But you've got to stand. And that's what you need to see. You need to stand for that. The third thing you need to do is that you need to pray. Notice what they said in verse 24. They said, And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, knowest the hearts of men. Show whether these two thou hast chosen. Now they didn't, he said, show whether or not. you know the heart. What he's saying is you know their heart and you know the man that drew them. That's what they were really saying in those words. And then you have to give careful consideration to prayer. You should always pray before you make decisions. And I have prayed and I have prayed and I have prayed. Now I don't know how many people have been praying in this church. I don't know how many we've gotten together around the altar to pray for the man of God. I don't know how many of the people that you have, I know your corporate committee, but I, I don't know how many of you have been praying on a daily basis. But you got to have some prayer to go along with your prayer. Because if you don't pray, don't expect God to lead you. Let me tell you something about prayer. Prayer is a great thing. God wants to do many wonderful things through you, right? But if you pray, it's not going to come by osmosis. You need to step forward on your prayer. You need to be strong and bold. And when you pray, get up and walk. And, and God can meet you. But if you don't get up and walk, you're not going to find out where God is leading you. So prayer, much prayer is needed. And I know this church has been praying. And I know you've been praying. And so I know that short is good for God's going to see you in your heart. But you've got to get everything out of your mind. You've got to get everything out of your heart. You've got to get any preconceived idea you have of what you want. You are not the one that's choosing. You are simply accepting the man of God that he is sending to you. And so even though you voted and you vote for him and God has placed him before you to make that vote, you have to allow God to send you whom he chooses. And that's not always easy. And it's not always the easiest thing to do. But God is, is ready. And he wants to do that for you. And sometimes God can send a man of God and he can send him and the church can be gone. been rejected by society and have been rejected by their own people. But God never took his hand off of that person. You may not get the blessing that God wants you to have because you reject the man of God. But God's not going to take his hands off the man because you have rejected him. That man is still anointed by God. David, when he was, was God had made him a king, we know that he killed him really uh, for the new law uh, because he did it 40 years. 40 years. And 
David can kill Saul on three different occasions. But the last time that David could have killed Saul, he stood up and he showed Saul his wrath. So David made a promise that he would never touch the man that was going to kill him. Sometimes you have to realize that whatever God sends to you or to us, we remember that God and do not turn back from him. God will never go down off of off of his mercy. And his mercy is unmerciful. He gives us a consequential uh, trouble, but he never says he's not going to bless us. He reminds us. And so we have to remember that God is sending you to speak to us, to pray with us, to talk with us. And then I want you to understand that you have to be responsible for making that clear. Look in verse 24, 25, and he says that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship in his Judas by transgression and fell, that he might go into his own place. And in 26 he says, and they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and his number with eleven. You see the responsibility of the soul is also the responsibility of accepting the church that God has given you. And what, what they did when they chose Matthias, they immediately added him. They didn't stop. They didn't miss a beat. They immediately added him to the ministry. There was no hesitation. That once the choice had been made, once they had taken a vote, the responsibility is taking the vote. That's your responsibility. And then the responsibility of accepting the choice and being obedient to that choice. And sometimes we just don't understand that. As Christians, we need to understand that. We need to understand that we, not only do we have to accept the responsibility for choosing, but we have to accept and obey once we've made that choice. Now, I'm not talking about somebody that is blatantly, blatantly, morally corrupt and bankrupt and wrong. What I'm talking about is the man of God may make a decision that you don't like. And the Bible tells us how we should handle that. And most of the times what I see in churches today is if the man of God makes somebody mad, they turn away from him and they walk the other way instead of handling it from a scriptural standpoint. Did you know that when you get mad at somebody in the church, you're supposed to go to them. And if they won't hear you, you're supposed to take somebody else with you. And if they won't hear it, then you're supposed to bring it before the church. Being in a church is not about, uh, a pastor is not about being a dictator. I've known some pastors that, that were told to step down by the church, and the pastor said, I absolutely will not step down. And it split the church. But I'm talking about the man that has been voted in that's okay and that he's making a few decisions that you might not agree with, but he's still the man of God, and you are still supposed to be obedient to God. I tell my congregation every morning, I say, listen, anything I bring to you out of the Bible, don't just trust what I say all the time. I know that you trust what I say, but go home, study it and read it, and check for yourself. And if you find that I said something wrong, bring it to my attention so we can sit down and we can talk about whether I may have said something wrong. Nobody is above making a mistake. But then we should straighten our decision together. And how are we going to work together if we're, we're constantly struggling against one another? You can't do that. If, if you're going to struggle with the man that you vote for, you shouldn't have voted him in. If you're going to continuously have struggles and, and because you just, you're not in agreement, then don't. already setting yourself up for failure. Bring the man in and all of a 
gets set down, it's just one struggle after the other between the congregation and the pastor. It's sort of like being the president of the United States. It's like the president, and he might be Republican, and the House and the Congress might be Democrat, and nobody could get nothing done. Or he might be Democrat, and the House might be Republican, and nobody can get anything done because it's constantly squabbling. They're constantly in disagreement. And how can a House stand if it is against itself? How can it do that? That's what the Bible says. The Bible says that in the Old Testament. He says, how? Can a house stand if it's against itself? It will be divided. And nothing is worse than cantering a schism in a church. Nothing is worse than that. Even the Bible says that in Proverbs, the Bible warns that I hate. I, he says that I hate. Out of some of the things that he said earlier, that he said he hated sowing discord among the saints. I try to tell my people this. I don't know if they get it. I don't know if they listen to me, but I, I tell them this. Listen, don't squabble. Don't sow discord. And, and, and please, don't. Don't keep your anger. The Bible says that the anger of the sun lies. You're not even supposed to let the sun go down on your wrath. But you know what? We do that. Some of us go to bed, we got an angry heart. And so when you choose the man of God, you need to make sure that you're going to back him. Here's the thing. When I was in kindergarten, I had two cousins. They were equal twins. And uh, I ha didn't have much trouble with her because she told me that she never wanted to be with one thing or the other. I thought of her as a condition to my graduation being seminary was that I had to be quiet. So they were my cousins. She stood by me. So it doesn't came to me when I was five. And on that Sunday night, he said, this will be the last sermon I ever teach you. And he pointed out the front seat. And here's what he said. He said, you know, the, the one regret you have in this ministry is there only been two, two ministers in the 26 years you have been pastoring. And he said, the regret he has is when he left, they sort of just kind of dwindled and fell apart. And, and this is what he said. think about. He said that when you find a pastor who knows what to do for his church, he said, do not be personal. He said, but find the man of God and you will be more than an amount of joy. But don't be personal. Find the man of God and you will go further Find the man of God, but don't be personal, because you will do greater things if you find the man of God. I want everybody to stand with me. I want you to think about.